Don't worry. Don't worry. After the baits are over, you still get your vote. Just pray along with me and follow along with me. I'm not going to take you too far off course. See, some of you are starting to think about that debate, that debacle that happened a couple of days ago, but I'm not talking about that debate. That debate is about some small thing on this earth, one country on a small earth in, in a universe that God owns. I'm not talking about that debate. That happened just days ago. I'm talking about a debate that took place in glory. That after the debate that started in glory is concluded, you still get your vote. I'm talking about the debate that took place between Lucifer and his maker. I'm talking about if you want to think that we have uh, political unrest here, we had political unrest in glory. Uh, we had political maneuverings in glory. We had Lucifer lying on God in glory and acting like it was the truth. That happened in glory. Didn't just happen on your TV box. That happened way before the foundations of the world were formed. This is not new for God. I'm talking about a debate that started long ago. Not only was there political maneuverings, but there was some uh, rioting. There was some fighting. The Bible tells us that there was war in heaven and Lucifer and his angels. So he had an army uh, uh, because there was a division in heaven. Now once they were one and they were okay and there was peace, but all of a sudden when sin found its way in the heart of Lucifer, division took place in glory. Your country is not the only place. This is just a, an after effect. This is a tremor of the real debate that started in glory. And folk got to decide whose side they were going to be on. They got to decide. Two thirds of the angels chose the wrong side. And during the war, half of them went back to the right side. Glory to God. I'm talking about a debate that's grander than red and blue talking of debate about evil and good, a debate about your salvation, a debate between two primary individuals. You know him as the accuser of the brethren. That is the meaning of his name. I will not say his name here today. I got no respect for him. He gave me too much trouble. He's caused you too much pain. Pat is crying in her heart because her mother's gone because of him. I will not call his name, but he's the accuser of the brethren is what his name stands for. That's his title given by God. You have the accuser of the brethren, but then you also have the advocate of the sinner. And I'm on his side. I don't have to question how the debate is going to end up. I know how the debate is going to end up. I don't have to worry about what they're saying on TV about who had which points and what did you think and did he really shine or was he flat today? No, Jesus is always shining. He always comes through in the debate. Jesus wins the debate. Now, I looked up the definition of a debate. Here's what it says, a formal discussion on a particular topic in a public setting in which opposing arguments are put forth. I thought, wow, a formal discussion on a particular topic in a public setting in which opposing arguments are put forth. And I thought about Zechariah. I thought about how Satan opposed him and stood at his right hand to say how guilty he was. I, I thought about how, how who we know is Jesus. The judge says, hey, 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 I rebuke you, accuser of the brethren. 
take off his filthy garments and give him new clothes. And when he spoke to Zachariah, he said, your sins have been removed from you. I'm telling you that in the debate where, where the accuser of the brethren says, no, 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 here's the record of what she's done, that the advocate can say, yes, but here's the record what I have done. They've claimed my blood. The debate is over. And I'm telling you that when the debate is over, you still get your vote but you're still you're still you're still confused you still you're not sure what's this vote i get do i get to vote myself into heaven no no the, the, the vote for me is an experience acronym it is four words that you want to experience that you're promised to experience that you long to experience v for a victorious experience o for an overcoming experience T for a triumphant experience, and E for an eternal experience. I don't care what the devil has said. I don't care what his accusers have done. I don't care what sins you have. If you claim the blood of Jesus, you put the debate to rest, and after the debate is over, you still get your victorious experience. You still get your overcoming experience. You still get your triumphant experience. And praise God, you have an eternal experience with Jesus. When the debate is over. Now, folk have come to you. I can imagine Robin at home. Her husband calls her and tells her what the boys are fussing about. And she decides who's right and who's wrong. Boys don't know this yet. Soon she walks in the house. Mom, they both start arguing and debating at the same time. And she says, stop. Because in her mind, the debate is over. She has already made up in her mind. There are folk who are coming at you. Uh, 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 this is what I think, and this is what I think, and, and in your mind, all you have to know is that when you fall on your knees and you ask God, cover me with your son's blood, the debate is over. It doesn't matter what they said yesterday or are saying now. It doesn't matter what the committee decides. It doesn't matter how, what they thought about you, because once your name is covered in the blood of Jesus, there's a transaction that takes place in glory. And everything gets cleaned up. And when God looks at it, he says, but I don't see the evidence spoken about here. It's as if you never done it. You can't hardly believe it when you ask God to forgive you, that you walk in a newness of life. And he comes around and says, here's your new heart. You say, what's this, Lord? Oh, this is brand new. Did you wash it? No, brand new. Did you pull out the stones? No, brand new. When you ask for it, you get it. Because for as far as God is concerned, when you depend on his son's blood, the debate is over. I invite you to turn with me into the book of Jude. Let's take a look at the book of Jude. Only one chapter, be careful you might. If you're on it and you're in Revelation, just back up one and you'll be there with me. And when you get there, I ask that you would just turn with me to the ninth verse. Jude, it's only one chapter, Jude, the ninth verse. And here's what it says. This is speaking of Christ. The Michael, the archangel, is Christ, the anointed one, Jesus, as you know him. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Does not bring against them a railing accusation, but said, the Lord, what? Rebuke thee. Uh, my argument is in opposition to yours. He is not yours. This body will not stay here. And, and there's evidence of that. Do you know when you read the Gospels that when Christ almost got to the crest of his anxiety, that he needed extra power from glory. One of the two people who visited him was Moses himself. That Moses, after this debate, experienced 
a victorious experience, had an overcoming experience, had a triumphant experience, has an eternal experience, so much so that when Jesus needed help, he could show up and say, my master, remember to hold on. After the debate for Moses, he still had his vote. I wonder if you believe that this can happen for you. I wonder if, if, if Zechariah is enough of a debate that turns out to be victorious, that if Moses is a debate that turns out to be victorious, uh, David is a, a debate that turns out to be victorious. Uh, I wonder if Enoch is enough of a debate that turns out to be victorious and overcoming and triumphant and eternal. I wonder if that's enough for you, if those ro who rose up with Jesus Christ when he rose from the dead, if that's enough for you. I, I, I don't want you to sit in the pew, to sit at home at Zoom, to think that, man, that sure is good for them, but I don't have that experience. There is a debate recorded in the Old Testament I would like to talk to you about. I'm skipping past David. I'm skipping past Moses. I ask that you join me in the book of Job. Let me tell you about this debate. You know, Job was not a joker. He worshiped God. You see, you need to understand that the only debate that's taking place right now is twofold. Who you worship and how guilty you are. That is the only thing that the accuser of the brethren is concerned about. And you will see this come through in this testing of Job. But before Job is tested, there is quite a conversation, there's quite a debate. We find in the first book of Job that Job is considered to be a perfect man. I'll read it for you. Verse 1, there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. David speaks about Hating evil, he says, O oh Lord, do I not hate them that hate thee with a perfect hatred. And God is speaking about Job here, hating evil with that same perfect hatred. And he had substance and he had family and he was the richest man on earth at that time and he was doing well. His stocks were up. He had all the servants. Everything was going well. And in the middle of this, there happened to be a meeting. Verse 4 tells us, actually not verse 4, um, let me jump down to uh, 6. And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser of the brethren came also among them. This picture is that in glory, all the folk who were in charge of the worlds that God had created had come as a grand executive committee meeting, if you would, to come and present how things are going before God. And the accuser of the brethren shows up, who has already fought in heaven and been cast out, who has already debated and lost. But he shows up nonetheless. And when he shows up, the Lord said unto the accuser of the brethren, whence comest thou? Meaning, what are you doing here? Which world are you coming representing? And he says, and he answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up, on, up and down in it. Meaning, I have my influence over the entire earth. Everything that's there is mine. All they do is what I want them to do. Everything is sinful, it's all mine. I, I walk up and down and I run the entire thing. At first they begin their debate 
about whether the accuser of the brethren need to be in the room. But now God switches the debate to one of the folk who live here on earth. And the Lord said unto the accuser of the brethren, Hast thou considered my servant Job, not yours, my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man that feareth God and escheweth evil? Have you considered my servant Job? And the accuser of the brethren says, Doth Job fear God for naught? Does he worship you for no good reason? I, you, you place the gate around him. You put a hedge around him. I, I can't even give him COVID now. I, I, I meant to hurt him. And, and you cause this thing to happen over here. And, and everywhere he walks, is as if nothing happens. He's got an umbrella over him that he doesn't know about. He's got a, a, a wall around him. And everywhere he walks, the wall just moves. And trouble can't come near him. I, I can't even touch his children. I, his finances are out of my reach. I, I, his marriage is perfect. I can't get through to him. Does he worship you for nothing? You make him to lie down in green pastures. You lead him beside still waters. When he's tired, you restore his soul. You lead him in the path of your righteousness for your own glory. Even when I get to impact people around him and he walks around the shadow of death, he doesn't fear because you, you, you keep making sure your rod and your staff are there with him. When other folk are hungry and they can't get by, you, 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 you prepare a table before him in the presence of his enemies. You allow me to see him getting fed and I can't do anything about it. Does Job worship you for nothing? This is the debate. I bet you, though, if you let me touch him, he'll curse you to your face. This is how he speaks to God. It's in the Bible. Verse 11. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Not behind your back but he'll curse you to your face. He'll feel the way that I feel about you, says the accuser of the brethren. At the end of this debate, the Lord allows a testing to come, but he does not remove his hedge. He does not remove the barrier. He says, uh, you can do all that you want, but don't touch him. And we know what happens, that he is tested, that his finances go away, that his children die, that everything he has is gone. And the Bible says that he does not sin. Chapter 2 comes. Same meeting, different time. The accuser of the brethren shows up. The debate happens again. What are you doing here? I control the earth. Have you considered my servant Job, who you tested for nothing and nothing took place? And unbeknownst to Job, while Job is, 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 is reeling from all that happened and Job is still praying and worshiping God in glory, there's a debate taking place. And while you are reeling from the things that happened to you here in 2020, I'm telling you that there is a debate in glory taking place. But in your debate, it's not just the accuser of the brethren pointing at you and listing all the things he got you to do and all the things he bet you would do. You also have the advocate for the sinner who is saying, my blood. And you need to remember this for this portion. In Job 2, the debate continues about who Job will worship versus who Job will curse. And you need to take this very seriously. 
because the debate that folk are waiting on in glory is not just about your obedience, it's about your cursing. That if you don't choose God, that if you don't submit to God, you are submitting to the one who has desired you to curse God to his face. You need to understand that it's not okay just to not act, that not acting is, is you're voting by not acting, that, that, that you're not just putting yourself at risk, but you are saying something to and about God no one should ever think through their brain. But Satan gets to use you as a pawn when that person gets on your nerves. Satan gets to use you as a pawn when you think no one is watching. And Satan gets to use you as a pawn to curse God to his face, to say your son's blood was not worth me changing my mind. That Satan gets to do that and point to that in the middle of the debate. That you weaken God's ability. In this second portion of the debate, what Satan does not comprehend, then, though he must now, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, is that every time you and Job go through a tough time with God and you overcome, you become stronger than where you were before. And what you need to see is that in chapter one, the debate ends with a testing that is allowed, but a border that Satan cannot cross. That if you submit to God, you are always protected. That after the debate, you still will be able to have your vote. You still will be able to be victorious. You still will be able to be overcomers. You still can be triumphant. And that if you hold on long enough that when he comes, you will have an eternal experience. You still get your vote after the debate is over. But Job's elaborate debate that takes place here plays out not just in glory, where Christ is advocating for us now, but also here on earth, you see, the accuser of the brethren has drafted people in your community into the debate. Drafted people from your family into the debate. Drafted people from your church into the debate. Drafted people you love into the debate. Drafted people you respect into the debate. You see, uh, what you need to understand is that that when, when Job now is able to be touched and his body is touched, you see, uh, uh, Satan says, oh, oh, you, he, he only worshiped you in chapter one because you didn't let me touch him. But he says, skin for skin. If you touch a man's bones, he will curse you to your face. Just let me give him COVID, man. Let me, let me reach out to him. Let me strangle him. Let me, let me bring cancer into his life. Let me take his, 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 his ability to remove. Let me do that. And God said, okay. Do what you want. But here's the line. You can't kill him. And Job says, the accuser of the brethren rather says, now. I will get these folk in Chestnut Hill to curse God to their face. And he's smart about it because he's not going to come straight at you. He uses the people you love. And later in this chapter, in chapter two, Job's wife says to Job, not knowing that she's being used as a pawn during the debate, why don't you just curse God and die? She's speaking, but the words, the breath that's coming across her vocal cords, it is the accuser of the brethren speaking through her. She is a puppet. You got some folk in your life that don't understand why you're holding on to this Jesus. 
why you're returning this tithe, why you're giving up your Saturdays, why you're going to Bible study, why you're doing this. How comes you're not fun anymore? Hey, come with us. Why are you frowning when I just, I just made a simple joke? Uh, uh, they, they can't understand. And because they cannot understand, they will say things that you don't get to understand, that you will, you will believe. I can't believe this is my friend, that this is someone who walked with me all this time. How could you leave me now? How could I want to better myself? How come you're not in my corner now? But in the debate, the accuser of the brethren does not play fair. He's going to have folk that you love, your children, your spouse, your parents, your sisters, your brothers, your aunts, folk that even if you didn't love anybody in your family, you got special folk outside of your family that you know they are the dearest to you and they have the ability because of how close they are to your heart to be used by the enemy to cut you ever so slightly and the pain that comes from that will cause you to crumble. In the debate, Satan does not play fair. But when the debate is over, Job believes, I'm going to prove it to you, that he has the ability to have a victorious experience, that he has the ability to have an overcoming experience, a, a triumphant experience, an eternal experience. Job, way back. In the Old Testament, before Jesus comes around, believes he will see his Redeemer on the last day. He has the very same confidence that, that Paul had. That's why Paul said, hey, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Job! believes that Jesus is going to show up, that really after the debate, he's still gonna be victorious. He's still gonna be an overcomer. He's still going to be triumphant. And when he sees his Lord and rises with him in the air with the rest of us, so shall he ever be with the Lord. He will have an eternal experience with God. Job, way back, believed in Jesus. He wasn't even talking about the first coming of Jesus. He's talking about the second. He skipped over the birth and all. He went to the end and said, I know. Turn with me to Job, Job, Job chapter, uh, Job chapter uh, 18. Go with me to Job chapter 18. I, I want to read something for you, those of you who haven't been acquainted with it. Uh, actually, let's go over to 19. Let's go over to 19. Um, what you need to understand is that in Job chapter 1, the debate is between God and the accuser of the brethren. Ultimately, Job is tested. He comes out as triumphant, as an overcomer, as victorious. In chapter 2, the debate is heightened. Uh, the test is also heightened. And we don't get at the very end uh, 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 of that chapter that, that it's just the debate between uh, the accuser of the brethren and, and the advocate of the sinner, now we have family members getting in and we have friends getting in and, and they start to argue, these four folk from chapter two to chapter 18, they debate on behalf of the accuser of the brethren against Job while the accuser of the brethren is arguing and debating against God. And for 18, for 16 chapters there, rather, the debate continues. In chapter 19, Job has had it. And here's his response. Verse 1, Then Job answered and said, How long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with your words? These ten times have you reproached me. You're not ashamed that you make yourself strange to me. How can you debate with me about this? Of course I'm going to believe in Jesus. Of course I'm going to take what he gives me. 
of course I, I should expect to take the good with the bad. I, I, I'm not going to change my mind about him now. Why would you debate with me about this? I can't even recognize who you are. And after speaking a bit about the fact that all these things have happened to him, he comes down with these wonderful words. Verse 25. For I know. I don't just think. I'm not just hopeful. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And if I have a Redeemer, that means I am redeemable. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me now, though it all will wrinkle up now, it will be destroyed now. When he comes, I'm going to have a different body. I'm going to have a different experience. I will have a victorious experience. I will have an overcoming experience. I will have a triumphant experience. I will have an eternal experience with God. I'm confident of it. Centuries later, Job is the first piece of literature that was ever written that was included in the gospel, in, in the Bible. So from way back then, when Moses in the desert sat and wrote this, from that time all the way to Paul, Paul walks away with the same feeling. He says, there's problems in 2020. I, I got issues in 2020. I, I have problems in Ephesus. I got problems in Rome. I got problems in, 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 in uh, Philippi. I, I got problems everywhere I turn. Uh, folk, he got beaten. He was imprisoned. He was flogged. Uh, his, his own uh, people turned on him, and then his own church brethren turned on him. He felt like there was nobody to turn to rest on. But yet he says, nevertheless, I am not ashamed of the one I have the contract with. You know, when you have the contract with Jesus, when it, you have a covenant with him, you can say, hey, hey, say what you want, but I got a contract right here. I'll show you right here. I see my name, and in blood, I see the name of Jesus written. It is covering all of my sins. I talked to him this morning. I prayed with him this morning. I've submitted to him. So no matter what you think about me, say what you want. But where it matters, no one is talking about it because they can't see anything except for the blood of Jesus. I got the contract with him. So debate if you want. But I'm telling you that after the debate is over, I still have a victorious experience, an overcoming experience, a triumphant experience. And praise God, I eternal experience when he bursts through those clouds. I don't know what you're dealing with. But anything that you're dealing with that brings pain, the debate is on. It's happening in glory. It's happening here. It's between God and the accuser. And the accuser is using folk around you, near you. Love them, but understand they're part of the debate. Pray for them, but understand they're part of the debate. And if they're debating you, the accuser's debating you. And if the accuser's debating you, your advocate is debating for you. Since 1844, October 22nd, well over 175 years ago, he's been standing in the court. Daniel 7 shows us that, advocating for us. So when your name comes up and the debate is on, he says, my blood, I got them. Don't you worry about that. My blood. And when you're covered by his blood, the debate is over. I wonder if you can imagine with me you being in glory. John could not have imagined it. 
yet God allowed him to look in through a vision and see what glory looked like. And in chapter 7 of Revelation, an angel was standing next to John and he says uh, in verse 13 of, of Revelation 7, one of the elders answered saying unto me, what are these that are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? You see, there is a picture that's casted of them before and they were, they were clothed in white robes and, and they had crowns of their heads and, and wreaths around their head signifying victory and, 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 and they had harps in their hands and, and everything about them said victory and overcomer and triumphant and obviously eternal. They're living in the very presence of God. And, 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 and he says, hey, John, who's this? And God said, John says, I, 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 I don't know. They're now debating about the folk in glory. And he says, these are they that have come out of great tribulation. Where they lived, injustice lived. Where they lived, imbalance was there. Where they lived, political wranglings were there. Where they lived, violence and shootings and unjust behavior was there. Uh, there was division there. Where they lived in 2020, John, I can't even explain to you. But now they've come out of 2020. They've come out of their tribulation and they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And for an eternity, they dwell in the presence of God. Let me see if I can get you, you were hesitant at the beginning, let me see if I can get you to rejoice and celebrate with me now. The theme of our biblical reflection today, will you be willing to do that with me? And say it to somebody next to you. Uh, say it so the enemy can hear you. Don't you worry. After the debate, you sure enough going to get your vote. A victorious experience. An overcoming experience. A triumphant experience. And because of the blood of Jesus, an eternal experience. God be with you.